Um, hopefully you've got a good start on it. Let me just make sure we're all clear on this again, just to emphasize the point, because this idea is going to come up over and over and over again. This right here makes the shape. It makes the parabola. Have we made any changes? Okay, ignore the negative 5 for just a second. Have we made any changes when we square this? No, so it's, it's that same standard shape, right? Okay, Tyler, what does that minus 5 do? Okay, so we're going to go down 5. So that tells us where the vertex is, right? So the vertex used to be at 0, 0. It's still at 0, but we moved it down 5, so it's going to be at 0, negative 5. So there's our vertex. So I've got one point on the graph, 0, negative 5. If I wanted to draw the axis of symmetry, it didn't ask for that, but I could draw that in. And then we go over 1, up 1 squared. Over 2, up 2 squared, so that would put us about right here. And then I can label those points there. So over 1, that would be 1. If I go up 1 from this, that would put me at negative 4. Over 2 from 0, that would put me at 2. Up 4 from negative 5, negative 1, right? And then I've got this point over here and this point over here. Those are symmetric. Make sure you draw the entire graph. Put arrows on the end. Label these guys right here. If I already know the y coordinates, I've actually got the hard part out of the way. This would be negative 1 and this would be negative 4. What's this one right here? Negative 1 and this one is negative 2. Now, this is a picture of all the points that work in that equation. So even though I didn't graph this one up here, if I took the time to figure out what it is, it should work when I plug it into that equation. Okay. Any questions? So remember, extend the graph, put arrows on the ends and all that sort of stuff. We've labeled the five key points, and then it says, identify the x and the y intercepts. Now, can somebody remind us, I gave you a little phrase, told you, when somebody says find the intercepts, how do you find intercepts? So disappointing. What's that? Okay, I, I said this, so you don't forget it, because uh, even students in calculus forget this sometimes. Make a little xy table. You're going to plug in a 0 for x. That'll find the y-intercept. And then you're going to plug in a 0 for y. That'll give you the x-intercept. So if I plug in a 0, I get out a negative 5. There's my y-intercept. It happens to be the vertex. Okay, now, if I want to solve for when y equals 0, I'm going to replace that, and I'm going to have y equals x squared minus 5. Now, how do I solve that? Yeah, I'm going to move the 5 to the other side, so this is going to be 5 equals x squared. And then how do I undo squaring? Square take the square root. So I'm going to take the square root here. So I get x equals, what do I get there? Plus okay, I do have a plus or minus radical 5 there. So there's my y-intercept. Here are my x-intercepts. And if you come over here and take a look, notice that it crosses in between 2 and 3. It crosses at a little bit more than 2. Square root of 5 is a little bit more than 2. So this point right here would be square root of 2, or sorry, square root of 5. Square root of 5, comma, 0. And this one over here would be the square root of 5, but with a negative in front of it, comma, 0. Okay, so I found the x-intercepts here. Any questions? Sure? Okay, so when we were solving for that intercept, we had to solve by using a square root. We had a perfect square in it. We could solve for that x by just moving the 5 to the other side, get the perfect square isolated, and then take the square root. So we're going to solve several problems like that because this skill uh, is really important. So if I were going to solve this, we do the same thing as if it were a radical equation. I'm going to isolate the square. So that's going to be x squared equals 25. Take the square root. So I get plus or minus... I get those two answers. By the way, let's just see if we can connect this right now. What shape would this be if we were to graph this? <laughs> Parabola. What did the negative 25 do? Dropped it down 25. So it would be way down here at 25, and then it would open up, right? So from here, everybody watching, you don't have to, I just want you to watch. You don't have to write this down. From here, I'd go over 1, up 1. Over 2, up 2 squared. Over 3, up 3 squared. What if I went over 5? How far up would I go? I'd go up 5 squared, which is? 25. 
25. So if this is at 0, negative 25, and I went over 5, that should be 5, comma 0. And this point right here should be negative 5, comma 0. Okay? See how those work on the graph? The x-intercepts are the solutions to that right there. Okay, let's solve this one. Anybody see a problem with this one right here? Okay, it equals a negative. So if I do take the square root, it's not that we can't deal with this. I get x equals plus or minus 2i. It is a non-real answer. So let's think about that for just a second. We looked at the graph over here and noticed that this is where it crosses the x-axis. Think about this graph right here. If you were to graph this, what does it look like? Where's the vertex? Zero four. 4. This moved the graph up 4 units, so it looks like that. Does that ever cross the x-axis? No. That's why we didn't get a solution to this one right here. A real solution, anyway. Okay. Now, there are some ugly types of problems like this. Those first couple were pretty easy. Let's take a look at this one here. Again, we're going to isolate the radical. So we're Sorry, not isolate the radical. Isolate the square. So I'm going to divide both sides by 5. So that gives me x squared equals 13 over 5. Then I'm going to take the square root. So that's going to give me x equals. Now, do I normally leave a radical uh, 13 fifths? Usually rationalize the denominator. So don't forget, we need a plus or minus. I'm going to do radical 13 over radical 5. And what do we do with this? We're going, to we're going to rationalize the denominator. So we're going to multiply the top and bottom by radical 5. So here are my answers. I get a plus or a minus. This is going to be radical 65 over 5. That's the best way to write that answer. 13 and 5 are both prime. I don't have any pairs of factors. That's the best I can do. And of course, can I cancel the 5 with the radical 65? Nope, because it's not really a 65, right? Okay, any questions there? Okay, then let's take a look at this one. <clears throat> Every one of these had a plain old x squared term in it, so it was easy to get by itself. These have perfect squares, but they're a little bit different. This is a perfect square of x minus 1 quantity squared, but that doesn't change the fact that I can get x by itself by taking the square root of this side and the square root of that side. So I end up with x minus 1 over here. What do I put over here? plus or minus 4. Whenever we put a square root into a problem, we have to account for the fact that, hey, when I squared it, that got rid of the sign. So it could have been negative to start with, or it could have been positive to start with. And then how do I finish this off? How do I write the answers? Let's move one, to, one on both sides. So we're going to add one here and add one here. So this is 1 plus or minus 4. Now, I suppose we could write it like this. But it's a good idea to remember this actually represents two different answers. One of the answers is x equals 1 plus 4, and the other answer is x equals 1 minus 4. So one solution is 5, and the other solution is negative 3. Any questions? Okay, don't lose sight of the fact that the point of solving an equation is to get a value that when we plug it in, it actually makes it true. So let's double check. If I take a 5 and plug it into this equation right here, it better actually work. So if I take a 5 and plug it in, I have 5 minus 1. That's 4. 4 squared is 16. Let's take a negative 3. It better work when I plug it in. Plug in a negative 3. Negative 3 minus 4, 1. Negative 4. Even though it's negative when you square it, it turns out to be a positive 16. Okay? And the next type of problem. When we solve something like this, again, it's got a perfect square over here, so I'm going to take the square root of both sides. This side with the perfect square is easy because all you do is you just take off the square. Over here, plus or minus radical 17. That doesn't look very nice, but it's as good a number as plus or minus 4. So to finish this off, I'm going to move 1 to the other side. So this is going to be 3x equals 1 plus or minus radical 17. I'm going to divide by 3. 
So here's the answer. 1 plus or minus radical 17 over 3. Everybody watch, please. I know some of you have done this before. Is that the answer? It's an okay way to write the answer. When we take the square root, we've got a plus or a minus. Unless that happens to be 0 that we're adding and subtracting, we get two answers. So let's write it as two answers. One of the answers is 1 plus radical 17 over 3, and the other answer is 1 minus radical 17 over 3. So there's one, and there's the other one. Any questions? Does that, does that kind of ring a bell? If I mean, if we say 1 plus radical 7, 17 over 3, and 1 minus radical 17 over 3, does that kind of pattern of saying those things, does that sound familiar at all? Hopefully it does, and hopefully by the time we get get done with this chapter, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah? Um, does it matter where you put the plus or minus sign or where you put the 1? Did you hear that? Okay. Um, the, the bottom line is uh, subtraction is not commutative. So on this one, you could write radical 17 plus 1 all over 3. On this one, if you were to reverse the order, you'd have to write negative radical 17 plus 1 all over 3. It's much better just to write the plus, uh, write it in this form. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay. How much less? Okay. Nope. Usually don't want to. Okay. All right. What's interesting about this next one? Yeah, when I move this over, I've got a 20. Now, I still have a perfect square here, and that's negative 20. I can still take the square root, so this is going to give me 2x plus 3, and then over here, I can take the square root of negative 20. I'm going to get a non-real answer. That's okay. What that's going to mean on the graph is it doesn't cross the x-axis at all. Okay, well, let's see. That's going to have an eye on it, right? Anything else we can take out if we're taking the square root of 20? Okay, so I'm going to have a plus or minus 2i with a radical, what's stuck underneath? A 5. So let's finish writing the answer. So this is going to be 2x equals negative 3 plus or minus 2i radical 5. And then to finish this off, I'm going to divide everything by 2. Yeah. Once I move it over, it's negative. Okay. okay, I'm not going to take the time to write this as two separate pieces, but we could. We could write one of them as negative 3, and that first one has to be negative. It doesn't change sign. Negative 3 plus 2i radical 5, all over 2. And the other one would be negative 3 minus 2i radical 5, all over 2. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's take a look at the next type of problem. Um, and... So the motivation for this, the reason why we'd want to go through a big, ugly list like this, and it, it looks like a lot of work. It's actually not. You get used to it pretty quickly. Okay? The reason we'd want to do that is you'll notice that every single one of these quadratic equations here, all of them already had a perfect square. Perfect square of 2x plus 3, perfect square of x, perfect square of x minus 1. They already had a perfect square. But if you'll look down below... Take a look at 51. This is like one on your Math Excel homework. It does not have a perfect square. It's got a perfect square with the x, but no it's perfect square with the x squared. But you'll notice that we've got this 6 floating around here. That makes it so that it's not a perfect square. We're going to have to make perfect squares, and that process is called completing the square. Now, I realize you've probably done this before. I want to make sure you're doing it the right way. Um, a lot of people, there's a step right here. They think of it as dividing by 2. We're going to multiply by 1 half, even though that's a fraction and people don't like that. In the long run, it's much, much better. Okay, It's more applicable in more situations. Okay, So here's the steps. We're going to isolate the variable term on one, variable terms, Okay, any, any terms of the variable on one side, and arrange them in descending order. We want to make sure we leave room to complete the square. You'll see what I mean by that in just a second. Divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient in front of the x squared term, if it's not already 1. Then we're going to take half times the middle coefficient, just the coefficient of that middle term, the plain old x term. Okay. 
We're going to square the result and we're going to add it to both sides. At that point, we'll have a perfect trinomial square. We're going to factor it and it's going to make things that look like this. And then all we're going to have to do is do what we did on these six problems right here. At that point, it becomes pretty easy. So before we actually solve problems by completing the square, we're just going to work on completing the square. And that happens from step two to step three. Okay. So this already starts with a one. And you'll notice that every one of those has a plain old x squared. So we're in good shape there. We've got that taken care of. Now we're going to take half of the middle coefficient. So you're literally going to think 1 half times 16. 1 half times 16 is 8. Now, when you figure out what that is, I'd like you to put a little dotted circle around it because we're going to use it again. Once I have that number, I square it and I get 64. This is now a perfect square. I've made this a perfect square. The reason I care about that is that it's now easy to factor. I'm looking for numbers that multiply to be x squared here, multiply to be 64 here, and somehow combine to be 16x. Does that pattern look familiar? Yeah, it's a perfect square of that variable, that number, square that. How do you figure out whether it's a plus or a minus? Middle term is positive, so there we go right there. So does this remind you of Chapter 5? McKay, does it remind you of Chapter 5? Because for me, big time, it reminds me of Chapter 5, right? Yeah. So half the middle coefficient. So 1 half of 10. That's 5. Positive 5. We're going to keep track of that. Square that, that's 25. This is now a perfect square. It's a perfect square of that variable, x, that number, 5. We put a square on it. Again, Sid, how do we figure out whether this is a plus or a minus? The middle term is negative, so that's a negative. So there is a perfect trinomial square. There's how we factor that perfect trinomial square. Okay, take a look at this one. Half the middle coefficient, 5. Whoops. Yep. Square that, 25. Perfect square of that variable, that number, and there's the sign. So notice the difference between these two problems. They start with an x squared. They end with a 25. The only difference is this is a plus and that's a minus. And the difference it makes is what we get when we factor that perfect trinomial square. If it's a minus here, we've got a minus there. If it's a plus there, it's a plus there. OK, any questions? OK, please make sure you know how to do these. Those are easy. Watch. Half of negative 3. Okay, I'm going to write negative 3 halves. I'm going to circle that. Square negative 3 halves. 9 on the top, 4 on the bottom. Now, it doesn't matter how ugly this is. It doesn't matter how ugly this is. That's perfect square of 3 halves. We've now made a perfect trinomial square. It's a perfect trinomial square of that variable and this number right here, negative 3 halves. Put the square on it. There's our answer. Look at this one. Half the middle coefficient. No, just the coefficient. That's a 1. What's half of 1? 1 half. I'm going to circle that. It's a positive one-half. If I square one-half, one-fourth. That's got to be a one-fourth. And if that is, this now becomes a perfect trinomial square of that variable and that number right there. And it is a positive one-half. Okay. Any questions? Okay. This problem right here is why I like you to multiply that middle coefficient by one-half. Because if you, if you were taught to divide it by 2, what do you get when you divide this by 2? You do get a negative number. You get a complex fraction. So you've got to think of that as dividing by 2 over 1. Flip it over and multiply. What do I end up multiplying by anyway? A half. 
So why not just take this middle one and multiply it by a half? If I multiply it by a half, I get negative three-fourths. I eighths. Oh, sorry, I wrote that wrong, didn't I? Three-fourths, so that's going to be negative three-eighths. Thank you very much for catching me on that. Okay? Square this, I get a nine on the top. Square the bottom, I get a 64 on the bottom. Take a look at how ugly this is. Do we care? No, because it's going to be a perfect square of that variable and this number right here, negative 3 eighths, quantity squared. That ugly thing is easy to work with in its factored form. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, I've got one for you. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. And the question is, why does the last term always have a plus in front of it? All six of these, every one of them had a plus. Zach? It's because that you are timing the coefficient by twice, so it has to have positive. You're timing it by itself twice, so whether it was positive or negative, whether that middle term was positive or negative, didn't matter. When you square a positive, you get a positive. When you square a negative, you get a, ne uh, get a positive. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at how to do these problems. So... The first thing we notice is we have all the variables on one side by themselves. That's the first step. The next thing we do is we make sure that it starts with a 1. Does that start with a 1? It does. So I'm going to save room to complete the square. So I'm going to move the 7 and the equal sign out just a little bit. And then I like to change colors here. Because at this point, I haven't really done anything to this other than change the way it looks. What's half of the middle coefficient? Positive 3. I'm going to put a circle around that. Square it. I'm going to put a 9. Now, that 9 was not in the problem to begin with. I added 9 to this side. How do I compensate over here? Careful. Do the same thing on both sides. If you can adjust on both sides, you have to do the same thing to both sides. Okay? We're going to, we're going to be putting them in vertex form, and at that point you do that. Okay, so I've got to add 9 on both sides. Everybody see that those two blue 9s cancel each other out? Okay, this is now a perfect square. It's a perfect square of that variable, that number right there, and then over on this side I have a 16. I go ahead and put the 7 and the 9 together, I get a 16. What's nice about this? Both perfect squares. So this is going to be x plus 3, this is plus or minus 4. So my answer is, if I move the 3 to the other side, it becomes negative. So I have negative 3 plus or minus 4. I suppose I could leave it that way, but that doesn't really emphasize the fact that there are two answers. And this is pretty easy arithmetic. So one of them is negative 3 plus 4. The other one is negative 3 minus 4. So the two answers are 1 and negative 7. There are the answers. Any questions? That's called completing the square. Okay, on this next one, it says complete the square to find the intercepts, x-intercepts. So that means, remember, when you find the x-intercepts, you plug in a 0 for y. So remember, y is the same as f of x. So I'm going to do 0 equals x squared minus 8x plus, uh, minus 1. Uh, but this doesn't factor, remember? Okay. So we're going to solve this by completing the square. So I need the variables on one side. I'm going to move the 1 to the other side. So I've got 1 equals x squared minus 8x. I've got plenty of room over here to complete the square. I'm going to change colors again. Half the middle coefficient. Negative 4. Square that. That's 16. If I added 16 over here, I better add 16 over here. So now I've got 17 equals. This side used to look ugly. Now it's easy. It's a perfect square of x minus 4 quantity squared. And from there, take the square root of both sides. Now it's just like we were solving those problems on the first page. So this is plus or minus radical 17. That's an x minus 4. And what's the only thing I need to do to get the x by itself? Add 4 to both sides. So that's going to give me x equals 4 plus or minus radical 17. Okay, everybody watch, please. 
That's okay. Would this be okay? No. Can I write it this way? Yes. No, okay. They're not commutative. The plus or minus has to go in front of the 17. And I probably ought to write this as two separate answers because one of them is 4 plus radical 17 and the other one is 4 minus radical 17. And I'll ask again, does that sound familiar, just saying those things that way? 4 plus radical 17, 4 minus radical 17? What are those? Uh, difference of squares. They're conjugates of each other, right? Okay. Let's see. How many more do we have? All right. We've got about five more. And a couple of these are ugly. Watch, please. Take a good look at this. The variable terms are on one side by themselves. That's great. But what's wrong with this? It doesn't start with a 1. Okay, It needs to start with a 1 in order to complete the square. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to divide everything by 9. Now don't freak out that that creates a fraction over here. x squared plus 2x. Save room to complete the square. Negative 8 ninths. Half the middle coefficient. Square it. Still 1. If I add 1 to this side, I compensate on the other side by adding 1. I've got to do the same thing to both sides. If I'm adjusting on both sides, I do the same thing to both sides. So now this is x plus 1, quantity squared. Now take a good look at this. I've got to combine negative 8 ninths with 1. 1 over 1, or I could write that as 9 ninths. So that's going to be positive 1 ninth. Now, why is that not that bad? Yeah. Yeah, they're both perfect squares. So this is going to be x plus 1, and over here I get plus or minus. Square root of 1 is 1, square root of 9 is 3. So my answer is x equals, whoops, negative 1 plus or minus let me write that a little bit better. X equals negative 1 plus or minus 1 third. Now, are you going to leave it like that? <laughs> Sid is. Sid's going to get it wrong on the test. Everybody else, we're not going to agree with Sid today. We're going to do it this way. We're going to do negative 1 plus 1 third and negative 1 minus 1 third. This is just going to be negative 2 thirds for one of the answers. And this is going to be negative four-thirds for the other one. Okay? Any questions? Yeah? When you do have an answer that, you know, like four plus or minus or say containing just like um, that. I'd like you to be able to do both. I would I would write it this way as two separate ones, probably on half the problems. And I'm not sure Math Excel wants you to write them. I think it wants you to write them with two separate pieces. Okay, good question. Okay, now this one is set up the same as that one. So I'm going to go ahead and start solving this by dividing everything by 4. That's going to give me m squared minus 4m. And then over on this side, again, after saving room to complete the square, I get negative 3 fourths. That's not the end of the world yet. It's a fraction, but we can deal with that. Half of this is negative 2. Square it, I'm going to add 4 to both sides. This side's easy. Again, it's just m minus 2 quantity squared. And then I've got to figure out this over here. So I need to take negative 3 fourths plus 4. That means I need to get a common denominator, right? So this is going to be negative 3 fourths plus 16 fourths. So that's going to be 13 fourths. Take the square root. This will happen most of the time. We're going to have an m minus 2. And look what we've got here. Plus or minus radical 13 over, what is this? A 2. And then I just need to move that over. So this is going to be m equals. That's a 2 when it moves over to the other side because we have to add 2 to both sides. 
and then plus or minus radical 13 all over 2. Now, I can leave it like that. That's not too bad. I can also do this. If I got a common denominator with this, this would be 4 plus or minus radical 13 over 2. So if you're going to write it as one single plus or minus expression, that's what it would look like. So this is okay. That's okay. What would be another okay way to write it? Two separate pieces. 2 minus, let's do the 2 plus radical 13 over 2, and then 2 minus radical 13 over 2. They're the two pieces that are separated out. Any questions? Okay, a couple more then. Want to demonstrate all the different types of difficulties. A couple of those, we've got fractions to deal with and stuff like that. Let's take a look at this one right here. I notice I've got two issues. This doesn't start off with a 1x squared, and we've got the 3 over here. So I'm going to do all of this at once. I'm going to divide everything by 2, and I'm going to move that to the other side. So that's going to be 3 halves equals x squared plus 5x. And I've got plenty of room to complete the square, so I don't have to worry about that. But what's not so nice about this? Positive 5 halves is half of that. So I square that. Remember, we're always going to be adding because we squared that. 25 fourths. So if I add 25 fourths and I'm going to adjust on both sides, I need to add 25 fourths. Now before you freak out and go, oh my gosh, this is too difficult, this side is <clears throat> pretty darn easy. Perfect square of that variable and that number right there. This really isn't that bad here. Get a common denominator, they both need to be 4, so this would be 6 fourths. So altogether this is 31 fourths. Whoops, let me change colors there. 31 fourths. Okay, and again, this happens nearly every single time. When I take the square root over, over here and the square root over there, I'm going to get x plus 5 halves on one side, plus or minus square root of 31, What's nice about this denominator? It's a perfect square, so it's 2. Now look how nice this is. This is almost better than the last one. What's the denominator here? 2. And what's the denominator here? They've already got a common denominator. So when I move that over, I get negative 5 halves plus or minus radical 31 over 2. There it is written like that. Here it is written as one single plus or minus statement. Negative 5 plus or minus radical 31 over 2. And then, of course, we could write it as two separate ones. So this would be negative 5 plus radical 31 over 2. And the other one would be negative 5 minus radical 31 all over 2. Okay? So again, make sure you know how to write those each of those different ways. <clears throat> Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left. Would you do number 73 right now? When you're done, check with your neighbor, see if you got the same thing, see if you showed your steps that you can understand them and everything. So again, get done with 73, check with your neighbor.
Chrissy, if we're going to find intercepts, what's the first thing we have to do on this one? Okay, even before that. Yeah, put a zero right here. Okay. Okay, and then what was the next step? Divide everything by two. So if I divide everything by two, look at the mess this creates. It only does one nice thing for us. It makes this x squared. This is going to be negative 3 halves x. And I'm going to move this to the other side, so that's going to be a positive 1 half. So does everybody agree that what I've got right here is everything that was in the original problem, it's just been rearranged? I wanted the intercept, so I set it equal to 0. Got to have a 1x squared, so I divided everything by 2. Everything there was uh, there to begin with, right? 1 half times the middle coefficient. 1 half times negative 3 halves is negative 3 fourths, right? So if I square that, I get a 9 on the top and a 16 on the bottom. So I'm going to add 9 sixteenths. So again, don't panic just because it looks ugly. That's a perfect square of x and negative 3 fourths quantity squared, right? This is ugly for the time being, but this won't be too bad if I just get a common denominator. 16 would be the common denominator. That's going to be 8 sixteenths. So that means altogether I've got 17 sixteenths. And look at this. Look at that denominator again. Perfect square. Okay. Square root of both sides. So here I've got x minus 3 fourths equals... This would be plus or minus radical 17 over 4. And again, I've already got a common denominator, so I move this to the other side. That's positive 3 fourths plus or minus radical 17 over 4. There it is written one way. I'm going to write it as one single fraction plus or minus radical 17 all over 4. Okay, And I'm going to leave the answer that way on this particular one. We've written several separate ones, so we should be good there. Any questions? Raise your hand if you got that on your own. About half of you. That's not too bad, especially with those ugly fractions there. If you didn't get that, are there any questions? Anybody want me to go over something again here? Okay, then let's take a look at the last one. John, what would we do first here for finding intercepts, x-intercepts? Okay, so we're going to set this equal to 0. Okay, Christopher, next. Divide everything by 2. So if I divide everything by 2, that's going to give me a 7, but remember, I'm not going to want that on this side, so I'm going to move it over here. This is going to be an x squared. That's going to be a 4x. Is this better than the last one? Quite a bit, right? Half. Positive 2. Square that. That's a 4. So I'm going to add 4 to both sides. What's a little different about this one? Negative 3, right? So what type of answers am I going to get? Imaginary. So we take the square root of both sides. This gives me x plus 2 over here. Again, once I get rid of that uh, leading coefficient, the process of completing the square and then taking the square root of that perfect square is pretty easy. We've just got x plus 2. In fact, I suppose you could skip almost from here down to there. I certainly wouldn't recommend it. Here we get i radical 3 with a plus or minus. So that means I've got x plus 2 equals plus or minus i radical 3. So that's going to be x equals negative 2. Once I move that to the other side, plus or minus i radical 3. We could leave the answer that way. It wouldn't be too bad, but it would be better if we wrote this, negative 2 plus i radical 3. There's one answer. And then the other answer is negative 2 minus i radical 3. Remember, it's that conjugate part. It's the one that had the square root on it. That's the one that's going to be changing signs. OK, are there any questions? Okay, there are a couple things you ought to look at in your book. They're on page 507 and 508. They're pretty good examples, good applications of this stuff right here. Um, we've got, 
almost 10 minutes left. Go ahead and get started if you look at the homework assignment. So this is on the calendar and on the homework assignment. Okay, 8-6 said book work for Monday. Then we had a quiz and Math Excel homework and quiz. What are these right here? Homework and quiz on Math Excel. Okay? All right. Um, you can go ahead and get started on that. Listen, if you did 8.6 and when you did that, you labeled your graph, put the function there and everything so it's easy to tell what was the function and then just look at it. Go ahead and turn it in. I'll take that now. If you didn't label what the function was, I'd like you to write that next to it. Okay? So if problem number 15 was x squared minus 7, and you just graphed it, labeled it and everything, but didn't write what the problem was, write that next to it and then hand it in. Okay? Good? Okay. I'll take those right here. You've got the rest of the time to work on the assignments. So you can write down the... Yeah, I, so the bottom line is I don't want to look at your paper and just see a bunch of graphs. I need to know Aww. which graphs I'm looking at. Okay. You can have graphs. So so you want problems? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the thing I just write them real quick. That works. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's okay. perfect. Like yep. This, this good? yep, that's good. Oh, wonderful. Yep. Nice job. Thank you. That's fine. Yeah, y equals is fine. Heck, you could just write the stuff with the X in it. You could forget the Y and the F of X. Yeah. 